hope you can. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm very honored and grateful to having been the opportunity to speak to you today. Thanks to all, Vice Rector, Director, all the academic authorities present here today. And let me start first by congratulating all of you for your choice, for the decision you took to enroll in this program. I think you made two good choices. First, a career in international relations. I myself made that choice a long time ago, and I have never regretted it. Second, you chose eBay, a fantastic institution we all look at with envy and proud. So let me start this talk by congratulating you for achieving your master's degree in such a renowned place. Excellence is a word we seldom use because there is very little of it. But you've been aware of the privilege of reaching it, and now you have to put it to some good use, right? Um, when I was preparing for this talk, I had this, top of, this topic of the new international disorder. But I thought that even if I still am going to talk about this, I was thinking more of you as practitioners, about your careers, about the jobs and things that you will be starting doing now. As, as, um, as, as it was said before, I've done different jobs or in different capacities. I've been teaching, I've been working for a newspaper, I've, do, I've been doing think tank life, consultancy. These are probably roles and capacities that you will be developing and that you will be filling along your career. And you will be dealing with problems, with actual problems, not only the problems you deal with uh, in class. And the problem of order and disorder and recommendations, and when you will sit down and write policy memos, it will be uh, probably the most defining moments in your life. There is this famous story of a policy counselor, a policy advisor, submitting a four-page memo to George W. Bush explaining him what the options were on Iraq. And the memo was rejected by George W. Bush saying, I'm the President of the United States and I have the right to be explained things in one page. Right? So, well, maybe the results show that maybe he needed four pages right, to, <laughs> to get around the complexities of Iraq and so on. But you will be doing these sort of things. And it is very important, what would be the glasses, what would be the lenses, what would be the theories and the frames that you will be using to understand problems. As I was preparing for, for this talk, I got this article by Graham Allison, by Professor Graham Allison, the famous author of the book on the Cuban Missile Crisis. He's working now on China, and, um, and, uh, and, and he has this book, and I offered him to send us a, a short version for El País so we could publish it uh, soon for our Spanish readers, and the Spanish readers would be uh, able to, to read at least a summary of his new book on China. And, his, and, and, and the book is on China and war. And the question is, will the United States and China go to war? Uh, this would be probably the defining question of our time uh, in many respects, as it was in the 30s or during the Cold War, whether there, there would be war between Russia and the United States, whether there would be war in the 30s. This would be the defining question of our time. Think of, and take this as a case study. Think of China. Will the U.S. go to war with her? Uh, Graham Allison says that, of course, if you follow to see this, there will be war, right? You remember because you've studied this in the Peloponnesian War in your classes when to see this wrote, it was the rise of Athens and the fear that this instilled in Sparta that made war inevitable, right? Graham Allison, in his project in Harvard, has studied 16 four major power transitions, and 14 of them ended in war. Only the transition of, of great powers between Portugal and Spain in the late 15th century didn't end in war because of the Tordesillas Treaty, uh, facilitated by, by the Pope. Um, the transition of power between the United Kingdom and the United States didn't end in war in the, in the early 20th century. The United States and the Soviet Union didn't end in war, though they fought many proxy wars, and you know. And um, if you want, the United Kingdom and France, the transition to power in Europe from United Kingdom and France to Germany hasn't ended in war yet. According to some, it will anyway, depending on which theories to use. But in all the other major cases in, in, international, his, in, in, in international relations, in history, there was war. So. The reasoning behind um, to see this and the reasoning between, behind this uh, war is inevitable is that China is a rising power 
and rising powers go to war with established powers, no matter domestic regimes. As you know, in structural realism, the international relations theory by, by Kenneth Wolf, we should and we can abstract everything but the capabilities of the actors. So if you were to advise Trump, maybe Obama better, but you know, you don't choose your bosses, um, you would have probably to write your memo and underline the word contain at the end of it or at the forefront of it. And especially you would recommend to contain China around the nine dashed line in the South China Sea. Draw a line and be firm, you will say, otherwise you will be interpreted as weak. Thomas Hobbes famously wrote something which is, to many, one of the founding uh, reasonings behind many policy advice, much policy advice, which is, covenants without the sword are bad words, he wrote, right? A hundred years after the First World War, you would conclude that if you, contain, you, if you don't contain China, you would end up into war, because the world today looks very much like 1914, massive interdependence, uh, with millions of people moving around, very thin rules, lots of geopolitical instability. So, if you want peace, prepare for war, right? But this is just way, one way of looking at it. Suppose Thucydides and, and Wolf were wrong. And you will be seething, almost involuntarily, in China's leaders' minds, the idea that the world is too small for these two powers, and therefore they need to challenge you by seeking to prevent a conflict with your advice to contain, you would be fueling this conflict, possibly leading to Third World War and millions of death. Maybe you would have, you would say, you should have listened to the colleague sitting next to you, the one who was not reading Hobbes, but maybe the one who was reading Kant, the one who was not reading Kenneth Walsh, but the one who was reading Michael Doyle and his theories of liberal peace. He. Uh, the one reading um, uh, Ruge, John Ruge and his ideas on embedded multilateralism. You or, or he or she would have written an alternative memo, which unfortunately maybe wouldn't get the ear of the president, but it would be a memo underlining words like positive sum games, relative gains, tit for tat strategies, Pareto optimals, and above all, how institutions transform preference and economic growth, and how economic growth, globalization, and trade create a vested interest in peace. So your memo, your alternative memo, would end up with a big and underlined engage, engage China rather than contain China. So this is just one way of looking at, two ways of looking at, at, this, same, at this case study. Think then of another major issue, Russia. Think of Putin's R Russia, where you would find similar dilemmas. Putin has profoundly changed and shaken the European security order. Professor Giuliani noted 10 major violations of international laws and major treaties behind his assault and annexation of Crimea and his support for the Donbass militias. From Article 2.4 of the UN Charter, Resolutions 2625, 1970, 1974 on hybrid war, armed bans and, 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 and violation of territorial integrity, 1975 Helsinki Conference, 1996 terms of accession to the Council of Europe by Russia, the Budapest Memo in 1994 um, uh, for the removal of nuclear weapons from, from Ukraine, uh, the 1991 Minsk Agreements, besides the constitutions of Ukraine, Crimea. Um, the policy discussion on Putin uses analogies of 1938, remember the Sudetenland, but also 1947, the Truman Doctrine giving birth to the Cold War. But some have also bring, brought into this discussion John Keynes and his work on the Treaty of Versailles in order to warn us about Russia. Contrary to China, Russia is a declining power. Economically, its GDP is like Italy's, and demo demographically, it's also shrinking. It does not export much other than raw materials and armaments. Worse than that, it has lost a war, the Cold War, and has reasons to feel humiliated. Political leaders exploiting sentiments of humiliation are likely to prevail. So um, maybe to understand contemporary Russia and what Putin is about, you should read not books on international relations theory, 
but maybe Sletana Alexeyevich, Homo Sovieticus, where you would find what are the keys behind the fantastic trauma which the end of Cold War provoked in Russians. So be careful about those who cry appeasement when you deal with Russia. Be careful on those who say, don't be too, uh, uh, be tough on Russia, and, and, and so on. So Neville Chamberlain was wrong back in, the, back in the 30s with his piece in our time, and if you ever have a chance to see the, the, the video footage of his arrival from the Munich conference wavering this piece of paper uh, saying, peace in our time, Mr. Hitler has assured me that he has no further territorial intentions whatsoever. And this was 1938, right? So, but at that time, we, we all know now that Churchill was right, but at that time, Churchill was an isolated warmonger, and Europeans were traumatized by the lessons of First World War. They didn't want another war, so they were willing to run the risks of appeasement. They had suffered the uh, First World War, and they saw how happily countries went into war and how disastrous this could be, especially for Europe and for Europe's civilization as a whole. So recommendations to fight next war with the lessons of the last one usually and inevitably tend to go wrong. Another case study in which you will be confronting dilemmas and issues where the lenses that you use will lead you to different um, policy conclusions. When, as a, a graduate student, as postgraduate students, I arrived to Washington, D.C. in 1998 uh, as a Fulbright scholar, the article of the year in Washington was an article by Martin Feldstein, head of economic advisors of, um, at the time, uh, President Clinton. Um, uh, and, and the article was called The Euro and War. The, the article had envisaged only two scenarios. The euro, which was about to be launched next year, either it would go right and the, United, the European Union will become a superpower and therefore there would be a superpower confrontation, therefore war between Europe and either the United States or uh, Russia, or the euro would go wrong and therefore there would be war inside Europe among uh, European countries. So it was inevitable to go to war whatever happened just because of the launching of the euro. We all know at this point, of course, how wrong this was, but this was the prevailing policy view in Washington or especially among some policy hawks at the, same, at the time in the United States when they looked at Europe. The same had happened uh, when the Berlin Wall fell a decade early, earlier. Some neorealists like Robert Mueller wrote an article in International Security saying that international relations theory uh, had only one recommendation or neorealism had only one recommendation for Europe is that you should give nu nuclear weapons to Germany. Only by nuclearizing Germany you would be able to create a successful balance of power in Europe. This was, these were actual policy recommendations in 1989. Fortunately, the funeral of Helmut Kohl yesterday uh, uh, showed how wrong, on Saturday, showed how wrong all these policy prescriptions were and how the balance of power in Europe was built on different assumptions, on different institutional mechanisms, on different, on different engineering. So the European Union is a challenge. It's an analytical challenge. It forces us to think through our concepts to be very eclectic and very flexible. It suffers, as you know, from, from what we call the N equals one syndrome. There is only one case. So be very careful when you do prescriptions on only one case, which is not even finished as a policy experiment. So handle with care when you deal with the European Union. More cases in which uh, policy advisors took uh, leaders or recommended decisions which were wrong uh, think of the genocide in Rwanda in 1994. This is the object of a fantastic book by Samantha Power, uh, Obama's advisor, A Problem Hole from Hell is the book. I really recommend you, if you haven't, that you have a look at this book because it deals with how to deal with genocides and how the, Uni how the United States failed to do this. In, in, we all know retrospectively that intervention in Rwanda makes all sense now. 
but at the time it was prevented by the Black Hawk Down syndrome because of the failure of intervention in Somalia by Clinton. Um, so again, one case led to the other in probably all the wrong ways. Or think of the improvised intervention in Libya in 2011, where France and Britain decided to oust Gaddafi despite not having an UN mandate. Libya is a chaos today, but the stick you should use to judge the actions of Hollande and, and Cameron at the time is even personal or should be personal. David Cameron had been a policy advisor on Bosnia earlier on when he was young, and he was quite frustrated by having been unable to prevent genocide in Srebrenica. So there came one day in which he thought he had a chance to stop a similar genocide in Benghazi as the satellites, as the, as the, as, as the footage from satellites uh, told him that the city was surrounded by Gaddafi troops who, which were about to enter the city and commit another massacre. So he decided without a plan to send the planes in, which is something which politicians uh, tend to do all too frequently. So yes, they prevented the massacre of Benghazi, but they created an even larger chaos. So this was another lesson. Think also of, Lib of, of Syria these days, in which Obama decided not to intervene despite uh, the, the evidence on chemical attacks. Uh, or think of North Korea now. Uh, what should policy leaders do on North Korea? Should you contain, should you engage in negotiations? What would be the best course of action? It's, all, it's quite difficult still with all we know. All these problems, they have one thing in common, of course, is that they don't have an easy solution. But there is, a, there is a deeper explanation for all these faults of international relations theory when we try to turn it into policy advice. Uh, in an article that made a deep impact, at least on me, when I read it first in 2000, published in the European Journal of International Relations, Stephen Bernstein, Janice Grossestein, and Stephen Weber um, published this article called uh, God Gave the Physics the Easy Problems, right? Their argument was very provocantly that physics had problems which you could deal with a chalk and a blackboard, a pencil and a paper. The real hard problems were those like poverty, hunger, and war, which you could not deal with with a piece of paper and a pencil. God gave the hard problems to social scientists like you, those which don't have an easy solution. So when they tell you from the hard sciences that you do soft sciences, yes, says so, but said your problems are much difficult, much more difficult than those they deal with that. And you can say it with proud. So the point by but Ned Lebo and, and, and these authors is that we cannot model social sciences on hard sciences for one very simple reason. In social sciences, as you know, there is reflexivity. Neutrons don't care about what protons think of them, right? They don't have a reputation. They don't care what they say about them. They don't learn from our observations and they don't transform their behavior according to our observations. In reality, happens. These things happen, contrary. I was very impressed about policy dilemmas once we had a meeting with Shivyednek uh, Brzezinski, policy advisor, national security counselor for uh, President Carter. Uh, Brzezinski uh, told us how was to brief a president. Maybe you saw this uh, leakage of a photograph uh, in Mar-a-Lago when one uh, friend of Donald Trump took a photograph of a young Marine with a, with a suitcase, which is called the football suitcase. All American presidents have around someone with a suitcase where, where from you launch nuclear missiles, right? So it's not, it's something like, it's very scattering, uh, very scaring, but it's actually the case. And Brzezinski told how this worked and how you would brief, how you would brief politicians on this suitcase. You open the suitcase when there is a threat of a launch of nuclear missiles and you have only 17 minutes to take your decision. And um, after that, you cannot bring your missiles back. It sounds sometimes like a bad joke of a, of a B-series film, but it's actually real. Um, one of the most impressive documentaries in which um, I think you can learn more about the actual policy decisions policy makers have to confront is the one by Robert McNamara, The Fog of War. Secretary of Defense with Kennedy during the Cuban Missile Crisis. He says something which made also a very profound impact on me. He said, from the dawn of history, commanders have sent troops into war without knowing what would happen. 
They made terrible calculus mistakes and people died. But in the nuclear age, which I had to live through, a mistake would lead to a nuclear war, millions of deaths, and nuclear winter. And then he tells this very frightening story about the Cuban crisis and how 10 years after the crisis was over, he met with Castro to exchange views on what had happened during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And he learned that everything he had supposed it was going on during that crisis was wrong because the missiles were already on Cuba, in Cuba and Castro would have, would have launched them if there was an attack, which the Americans thought it would have been a preventive attack to prevent the missiles from de being deployed. And, and, and he yells at Castro, you know, saying, are you crazy? You should have told us that you already had the missiles because our preventive attack would have created a nuclear war between the two of us. So again, to make my point, if it's not clear by now, much as in economics, social sciences deal with expectations. And this is a very thin stuff and a very delicate stuff. The proof that markets don't tend to equilibrium, George, George Soros once said, is me, he said. You know, George Soros has dedicated all his life to make money betting against equilibrium and then you know, put into some good, to, to some good use in, uh, in philanthropy. But he's been trying to understand how reflexivity and emotions create, create boom and boost cycles. In his book, The Alchemy of Finance, he anticipates something Facebook and others have done afterwards. You can, make, you can make a lot of money on human emotions. Finance, he said, Soros said, is, is the same thing. You can create money from nothing. It's only from expectations that you can create money. Therefore, finance, modern finance, is alchemy. You can turn trust into gold, expectations into money, feelings into war, and so forth and so on. So social sciences, Ned Lebeau and his colleagues, colleagues defended, should model themselves on evolutionary biology. And they were right. Another seminal book, Steven Pinker's on the better angels of our nature, if you, you will see, and, and I think it's very much, a very much compelling argument, that humanity has evolved in lines which remind us of evolutionary bi bi biology. Violence has decreased substantially throughout history even if Thucydides uh, would still speak on Spartan ways about China. Individuals and society, and there is empirical evidence about this, have learned and are learning to live by each other to avert conflict. So I don't want to open a debate on the exact reasons of this or even on the empirics of this because this is all very complex, but I think there is a very compelling argument to on evolution um, and peace and international relations. So I want to appeal to your responsibility as practitioners, as scholars, or policy advisors to uh, when we interact with the world, we transform the world by just observing it. And also, in your case, you will be acting upon it. And in some cases, you will, create, you will be creating self-fulfilling prophecies, sometimes for good, sometimes maybe for wrong, and you will have to, re to learn for that. So to conclude, you are at both ends. Uh, there is just one world, and you have to help others understand it and take decisions. So please handle with care. Uh, it's a very delicate one, and we only have one. So I wish you every success in your future careers. Whatever you do, think tanks, universities, policy advice, consultancy, even as ordinary citizens, uh, you will be concerned citizens about the shape of the world and the future of it. So thank you very much, and congratulations.